Hello, good morning. Welcome to workshop 14, Home is Where Spirometry is, Current Issues in Home Spirometry. My name is Mary Lester. I'm an adult respiratory therapist at the Anton Yelchin CF Center in Los Angeles. Oh, and I'm, and I'm Michael Schechter, and I'm also an adult, but I take care of children. I'm a pediatric pulmonologist at uh, the Children's Hospital of Richmond VCU. All right, go ahead. We'll go to the next I'm going ahead? Okay. Let's, let's get started. Let's get started. We're on a timer here. Okay. I'm already having a problem. Okay, so this is, we, neither of us have any disclosures that are specifically related to this presentation. We have a brief introduction before we get started. Um, oh, come on. Okay, so we, we have some data from the CF registry that serves as an interesting introduction to this whole discussion. Um, and this is the 2021 registry, so you're seeing this data probably before anybody else does. Um, so this just gives you an idea about what's been going on over the last several years um, in terms of in, encounters in person versus telehealth. You can see there is this huge drop off in March, in the notorious March 2020 um, in uh, uh, in person encounters. And while we have gradually uh, increased back over the over the last few years. We're still basically at about 75, 80% of uh, where we were for in-person clinic encounters uh, before. And while there is a big jump up, again, at the beginning of 2020, that's been dropping for telehealth encounters, but we're still seeing around 25% of our patients in uh, um, uh, telehealth encounters. And you can see this, is pretty, this has been pretty stable over the last year. So basically, telehealth is here to stay. Um, and so now what we need to do is we need to really work on maximizing the benefits of telehealth and making those telehealth visits equal in value to, uh, to our patients. Um, so um, this gives you an idea about where we still have a little bit of room to go. Um, so again, this is over the last 10 years, average number of cultures and PFTs. And so for purposes of this symposium, we can focus on the blue line. And you can see that there is this big drop off, as you might expect in 2020 with PFTs. But the recovery of um, number of PFTs per patient has really lagged. And so it just goes to show that while we are embracing telehealth, we still need to work a little bit on how to improve all of the features of telehealth, and in particular, um, home spirometry. So, Mary? Go ahead, do the objectives. Okay, I'm doing the objectives. So the objectives of this workshop are to compare the varied CF center approaches to the distribution, training, and data collection of home spirometry, describe a successful reimbursement process for remote home monitoring, and discuss how home spirometry monitoring can affect clinical decisions and support the collection of valid data on research participants, which is the other part that needs to be strongly considered here. Okay, so here's a list of our speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Laura Beth Rupchit. She is a physician's assistant at the University of North Carolina Adult Cystic Fibrosis Center in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. She's been working on the UNC CF team for six years, working primarily in the outpatient setting with an emphasis on quality improvement and clinical research. Okay. Let me see if I can help you with this now. Okay, so you're good. So you can use this to forward and then you're going to have your setting and at five minutes to go. It's going to be perfect. All right. Good morning, everybody. We just had a, a session on home spirometry before this, so this will be our second session. So to, this morning I'll be talking about our abstract titled Successful Creation of a Home Spirometry Program Within an Adult CF Clinic. Um, it's poster number 64, so feel free to check it out in the poster gallery or in the app. 
That's right. Yeah. I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. So as everyone here knows, highly effective modulator therapy in the COVID-19 pandemic completely transformed cystic fibrosis care. And that is a big theme we've been talking about at this conference. Suddenly, our patients were healthier, not needing to be hospitalized as often, and we were all stuck at home. It sounded pretty awesome at the time. However, all of our normal processes went out the door and telehealth became the new norm. And while this was great for keeping in contact with our patients, especially the ones who live far away and have a hard time coming to clinic, we know as CF providers how important that one piece of objective information is, PFTs. Although our patients are much healthier on highly effective modulator therapy, number one, not everyone qualifies, and number two, it's still necessary to closely monitor lung function. That's where home spirometry comes in, as we all know. It has proven to be a useful and accessible tool that our patients can use to monitor their lung function outside of the clinic. Let's see if this works. No. In the spring of 2020, like all of you, our adult CF clinic at UNC began to distribute home spirometers through the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation program. We were fully on board with incorporating home spirometry into our new processes. However, we encountered some roadblocks. Due to COVID, everyone was spread out. The physicians were in the ICU. Our respiratory therapist was in the hospital, and I was leading this on my own, trying to educate patients and get them to use that device. And it was hard. It was also hard to get the clinicians fully on board and the team members fully on board because this was such a new uh, process. We've, we had some patients who already had home spirometers, but for this many patients to have it, it was new. So we needed a standardized home spirometry program. Around early 2021, once our adult CF respiratory therapist, Donna Inlow, is here with me today, was relieved from her duties taking care of um, inpatient COVID patients and came back to clinic, we decided to collaborate or partner to create a home spirometry project. Our aim was to create a, home spir um, a standardized home spirometry program and, util and improve utilization at our center. The goals of our project were to provide individual education for all patients with a home spirometer, incorporate home spirometry into the respiratory therapist workflow, and lastly, provide monthly interpretation of home spirometry results. We went into this in much more detail in our last session. It was discipline group number 16 titled Home Spirometry um, Initiation, Documentation, and Billing. However, um, to briefly review our methods, some of the ways that we accomplished our goals were by number one, utilizing patient portal messages. For us, that's epic my chart messages. We use those to engage our patients who were still needing education. We also use those to remind our patients to use their device before all clinic visits, so before in-person or virtual visits. Number two, we went on to complete our education visits in clinic. So again, in, in person during clinic and during virtual visits. And if the patient didn't have an upcoming visit, we reached out to them by phone to complete their education visit. We wanted to get our patients up to speed with the process as quickly as possible. So during this visit, we went over when and how to use the device, how to clean it, how to share their results, and so on. And number three, we created an educational handout. And this was to reinforce the teaching we were doing, to answer the most common questions, and to be a reference for later use when the patient got home and forgot everything we, we just told them. We then wanted to find out how we were doing. 
So from November 2021 through January 2022, we distributed a satisfaction survey to our CF patients who had a device and our adult CF clinicians. The questions utilized a five-point Likert scale and were adapted from a previous home spirometry survey that was used in lung transplant patients. So what were the results of all of these efforts that we, we had done? So in terms of overall numbers, we have 333 adult CF patients in our clinic and 285 or 86% of them have a device. 274 of those have the MIR SpiroBank smart device, which is the one that CFF partnered with Zephyr X to provide. Also, 11 patients had another type of device, and many of those had been obtained prior to the pandemic. To date, 265 out of those 274 patients with the MIR SpiroBank smart device have received individual education by myself or by Donna. And for the 3% who we haven't educated, that's because we haven't been able to reach them despite multiple attempts or their loss to follow up from our clinic. Next, we have fully incorporated home spirometry into the respiratory therapist workflow. And now Donna reviews home spirometry during all of her annual RT assessments with her patients. Also, as the APP of, at the clinic, I'm reviewing and interpreting all of the results that come into the Zephyr X dashboard per month. In terms of dashboard use and monthly sharing, we currently have 112 patients who are active on the dashboard and have shared their results with us at some point in time. Also, on average, we have about 25 patients who share their results with us per month. And here you can see that we have tracked um, dashboard use uh, per month, you know, broken down by the month. We have additional patients that are not sharing their results with us over the dashboard, um, and instead they have chosen to take a screenshot of their results and send that, those to us through the patient portal, which I know some other clinics are doing. And up to this point, we haven't formally tracked those patients, so unfortunately I'm not able to provide any specific numbers um, except for the ones that are on the dashboard. As a caveat, um, during our education visits, I did want to share that we go over with them their options for sharing, and one of those is turning on the sharing in the app and sharing with us over the dashboard, and the other is opting to take a screenshot and share through the portal. Uh, we let them know that that's completely optional. That's what we've decided to do as our clinic. And we let them know that there could be a charge associated with sharing over the dashboard due to billing. Um, and it's really come down to patient preference what they choose to do. So briefly in terms of billing, we fairly recently started billing in the spring of this year. And that was after our contract with Zephyr X was finally approved through our institution. And also our billing plan was confirmed with our coding and compliance department. After review of all of the CPT codes that could be used for home spirometry, remote monitoring, our institution approved us to use code 94016, which is a professional fee for the review and interpretation of results. And it can only be billed once every 30 days. We have been tracking billing on a monthly basis since we began and been working with our, our billing department and looking at the reimbursement. And as a, a quick side note, um, many of you know that tracking billing takes time because it has to be sent to the insurance and reviewed and that can sometimes take months to find out the result. Um, so the data we have is through August of this year, which is what we were able to obtain before this presentation. And uh, up to that date, 103 tests had been submitted for billing and 79 of those had been fully reimbursed, which is 77%. 
Some of those um, are still in the appeals process and overall our billing data is still being collected. And as I mentioned, we started this in the spring, so I'd say we're still um, early in the process. The good news is that only a handful of patients have stopped sharing over the dashboard due to having a copay or it not being covered by their insurance. So that's the good news. And then finally, in terms of reimbursement amount, so far we have been able to cover the cost of the dashboard plus generate some revenue. Finally, moving on to our satisfaction survey results. All six of our adult clinicians have completed the feedback survey as well as 78 of our patients. The results indicated a high level of satisfaction and sense that spirometer use was clinically useful. Here you can see a graph of our clinician survey results showing that the majority agreed or strongly agreed with the survey statements. And these statements address their overall satisfaction with the program. In addition, it addressed that they felt that the home spirometry chart notes were useful, that they routinely encourage their patients to use their home spirometer, and that they routinely ask their patient about, patients about home spirometry results, that they feel that home spirometry is useful for making a treatment plan, that they feel that the home spirometer produces accurate results and that their patients received adequate training. Next, you can see the patient survey results. And also these showed that the majority agreed or strongly agreed with their survey statements. And again, they address the overall satisfaction with the home spirometry program. And in addition, that they felt it was helpful to share their results on the dashboard, that the home spirometer made them feel more secure, that the team was interested in reviewing their results, that the home spirometer was easy to use and accurate, and that adequate training had been received. In addition, there was another question that was on the patient uh, survey that wasn't on the clinician survey, and it asked about barriers to use of their device. And 48 out of 78 of the patients, or 62%, selected none. Some of the most common barriers that were selected were anxiety, being too difficult to use, being too time consuming, forgetfulness, or accuracy. However, these were selected in small numbers. So in conclusion, we feel that we have created a successful home spirometry program at our center. We now have a standardized program in place and have improved utilization and familiarity among our patients and our team members. We accomplished all the goals that we set out to do which included educating the majority of our patients, incorporating it into the respiratory therapy workflow, and providing monthly interpretation of home spirometry results on the dashboard. Lastly, the survey results indicated that both clinicians and patients felt that home spirometry was useful and um, were highly satisfied with the program. Lastly, I'd like to give credit to my respiratory therapy colleague, Donna Inlow, who's here today for partnering with me on this project. I could not have done this without her. It is a lot of work and takes a lot of time and dedication. I also want to thank our nurse coordinators, Nicole Bingham and Nancy Efland, as they have been fully on board from the beginning and have um, really taken the reins on incorporating this into their sick triage calls. And lastly, to our director, Scott Donaldson, who has helped us with this project. Thank you all so much for your time, and I will open it up for questions. Thank you. We have a number of questions that have been sent. I'll just read through them. Um, question number one, was spirometry done with real-time coaching, or did patients perform on their own? 
Great question. Um, we have not um, highly utilized the re real-time coaching feature. Um, uh, we have in a, in a small number of situations, but really our home spirometer use has been done independently by patients. We do spend a lot of time uh, reviewing technique and uh, we, before all of their clinic visits, we ask them to bring the device into clinic with them. Not everyone does that, but uh, one of the purposes of that is so that if they are having trouble with it, they can sit down with our respiratory therapist and, and practice using it and compare it to their clinic results. So, um, yeah. Okay, next question. Why didn't you bill for those who sent a screenshot? Good question. <laughs> Um, Sorry, you're not hearing me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> was well, there any, oh, what was the question? Why didn't you bill for those who sent a screenshot? Yes, another good question. I think um, up to this point, um, like I mentioned, we have not been formally tracking those patients who are sending a snapshot. Um, and have opted not to, to go down that road at this point, I would say it's, I'm not gonna rule it out for the future, but um, as you may hear from some of the future presentations, um, this endeavor takes a lot of time and effort, um, and so we have at this time opted not to go, go down that road. Okay. Um, what do you do when insurance doesn't cover or rejects remote monitoring charges that you submit. Are your CF patients getting a bill or are you just dropping them? Yeah, um, also as I mentioned, we are fairly early in this process, but um, yes, some of the patients are getting um, a small copay or bill or charge as associated with it. Um, we, for patients who have complained up to this point, we have, um, uh, eaten the charge per se. Um, so um, at this point, most of them have been um, approved and accepted. Um, but again, yeah, we're still, we're, it's still a work in progress. Okay. Was there any validation with the PFT results from the clinic for each patient? Great question. Um, so we are work with my respiratory therapist and um, we are not working directly with the PFT lab. Um, we don't involve our, our PFT lab in our project. Um, there's a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling with compliance buy-in for this billing. Any advice? Say that again. I'm struggling with compliance buy-in for this billing, actually. I'm, I'm not, be sure whether they're asking about issues with the billing department or issues with the patients, but yeah. I think those are both problems. Um, yeah, both problems. So um, in terms of compliance, we agree that we struggle with compliance too, and Donna, that's why Donna and I spend a lot of time reinforcing this with patients, talking about it, reviewing it, um, and encouraging them to use the device. Um, again, not Every patient ha who has a device is using it, and so we have, um, you know, told them that we, that's okay, and that we support them, and if they decide to use it later on, then that we encourage them to do that in terms of being on board with compliance and billing specifically. That's why personally we have let patients know that there could be a charge associated with billing and have given them that choice, but um, I think it really comes down to your specific clinic, what, um, you know, talking with your institution and kind of figuring out all those details. Okay. Good. I'm sorry, there are so many other questions, but we have to move on to the next speaker. Okay. So thank you for that presentation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, our second speaker is Dr. Peter Chung, who is currently the Associate Director of the Anton Yelchin Adult Cystic Fibrosis Program at Keck Medical Center of USC in Los Angeles. 
Peter's involved with the Pulmonary so, Critical Care Fellowship yeah. Program so and the like Lung the Transplant Program at USC. Click on this. This doesn't seem to be working. So just do that. Okay. And this is going to turn yellow at five minutes. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for having me. Uh, thank you, Laura Beth, for that wonderful talk. And hopefully some of what I'm going to share today may answer some of the questions and additional insight as to how our program has been successful in billing for home spirometry. So our, our title is Home Spirometry Billing, Don't Blow It. I have no um, disclosures for this uh, presentation. And I put up these pictures here. Um, first of all, I had no idea there was a product called Don't Blow In. I have no financial um, uh, relations with this product, but apparently it's a hair product. Um, I certainly don't, haven't used it yet, but after this talk, I think um, maybe I'll give it a try. Um, the second picture I have here is Mount Everest, and obviously it was a monumental task for our center to implement billing for home spirometry. Um, it's an uncharted territory that um, many of us have not explored. And the last picture I have here is to just demonstrate that there are um, failures, there are success, and there's crossroads. Um, and I certainly wouldn't be giving this talk if it wasn't for the different members of our um, CF team and uh, different uh, administrators and support we had at our institution. So as we all know, in 2020, we had um, the COVID crisis and many challenges occurred, both clinical side and on the business side. Um, obviously, the clinical care, there's been challenges um, and there's been changes um, in availability and restriction on diagnostic testing. Uh, many clinics were canceled or reduced in numbers for various reasons, including provider availabilities due to inpatient uh, responsibilities of taking care of COVID patients. But also, you know, uh, limiting exposure to COVID-19 um, for people with cystic fibrosis and members of the CF team. Face-to-face -face clinic visits were um, replaced with telemedicine clinic visits. And as mentioned before, um, telemedicine visits are here to stay. Uh, with that, obviously, uh, we were limited in somewhat uh, providing the best care, clinical care for our patients and uh, providing treatment plans. Um, the, especially the unavailability of spirometry treatment that we were unable to monitor exacerbations or lung health of people with CF. And we were also unable to monitor response to therapies on uh, modulators, modulator therapies or any exacerbations, right? Um, on the business side, there are operational challenges. Uh, reimbursement model changed. Um, the clinic revenue in general has decreased um, accounting for some of the downstream revenue um, that were associated with face-to-face -face or in-clinic visits. So um, we began to explore this a little bit um, more early on. And as mentioned before, the foundation came to the rescue with partnering Zephyr and um, providing HS for people with CF. And with the HS, uh, we were able to provide um, clinical care for our people. And for our center, from July to December 2020, we were very aggressive in implementing the HS um, to our people with CF. Um, first of all, our care center took initiative and goals were defined. What I mean by that is, um, some of the initiative that we took that were mentioned before is validating whether the HS, the home um was accurate and precise in comparison to our usual clinic spirometry. Uh, we did this internally and we found that they're, are, they're essentially pretty accurate and precise when done and performed ac uh, correctly. We also discussed the frequency of um, encouraging how often we should be using HS. Is it weekly? Is it bi-weekly? Is it monthly? Um, we initially set out to do a weekly, um, as far as frequency is concerned, and, and the rationale was to have people be familiar with the device, although we've got a lot of feedback that that was a little too frequent. And I think at the end, we ended up encouraging people to perform at least um, monthly for the device. Um, certainly, we encourage them to use it prior to their telemedicine visits or if they're experiencing new symptoms. Um, as far as distribution was concerned, uh, we prioritized the people with severe lung disease. 
um, those listed for lung transplant, and those on modular therapy requiring frequent monitoring. And as far as education, our respiratory therapist was instrumental in setting up the device, the education, and uh, follow-up visits and reminders um, for our, um, patients. Our team also uh, learned a lot about HS and sent consistent uniform messages to the people with CF regarding its importance and use during these challenging times. And finally, um, we identify key stakeholders as far as billing is concerned, which I'll talk about um, shortly. Um, as mentioned before um, in previous sessions, Zephyr Home Spirometer has two options, the limited and the full um, dashboard. Uh, we certainly encourage the full dashboard options. And with this, you get unlimited access um, um, by a user with a single maximum charge per month. The benefits include, as mentioned here, um, it is accessible by all, all parties, including um, the patients, the care team members, as well as the research team. Um, we are able to review all the data um, and all the episodes. And finally, we're able to also trend these results, um, print them out for PDF so that we can upload it to, their, uh, to the chart of the patient. The screenshot that was mentioned before has limited options. Um, as far as um, the data that's available. However, it is free um, of cost. Um, and um, the other thing, you know, that we were, so we, we essentially encourage everybody to use the um, dashboard option um, when you're using the um, HS. This is an example how the dashboard looks like. Um, just for um, those um, who are not familiar with it, there's a um, a login screen and there's a code for authentication, so it's very safe. And this is an example, a screenshot of how the provider view looks like. Patient's name, the comments, the times they've used, the last use, um, it flags if there's a new activity, and there's an option to remove patients should they change um, care centers in the future. Again, further a screenshot view of the provider view. Um, this looks at the trend again, the actual flow of, uh, volume loop, and a number of temps, um, and all the numerical objective values. So back to the billing. Um, so members of our team attended the Zephyr webinar um, and got a lot, a lot of useful information, including only provider of record or treating provider can bill. This includes APP, depending on the state, on initial note, pre-billing um, includes home spirometry recommendation with plan of care for use as well as follow-up plan. The home spirometer remote monitoring requires an order in the EMR. And the home spirometer results within the EMR is documented and um, provider analysis is uh, also documented in the chart. I've listed some of the CPT codes we've used that have been successful in generating revenue here. The 99453 code is the initial setup. The, uh, the 94014 is the parent code that in for a non-hospital based clinic. Our, clinics, uh, our clinic is associated with the hospital, so in that case you will be using a 94015 code, which counts for the technical fee and 94016, which accounts for a professional fee. So depending on how your clinic's set up, um, you'll be either using the 94014 code or 94015 paired with 94016 code. Next, there are remote therapeutic monitoring codes. Um, those are fairly new to us. Um, we'll talk about it briefly. And those are 98980 codes. They include monitoring and treatment management services in 20 minutes in intervals. So how do we, how are we successful in implementing our HS program and billing successfully? Uh, first, we identify key stakeholders. The key was to really, really discuss our HS program with the clinic business, business administrator. Um, and he was able to point us to other different stakeholders, including the revenue integrity team, uh, which is essentially the billing team, the revenue auditing team, 
and the informational technology team. All these stakeholders were very important in making our building uh, a successful um, project here. Um, the revenue integrity team um, were, was able to point us towards the CPT code reimbursements. The auditing team was able to point us towards uh, an accurate and compliant documentation required in the EMR. And the technology team was instrumental in providing the order as well as um, guiding us to uh, exactly where to upload some of our data. This was a process plan for remote monitoring. Um, the templated pl provider note was um, initially done and then we placed an EMR order. Um, the setup was performed by our respiratory therapist and an EMR documentation was performed for billing. We kept, a, we kept track of all our HS in a spreadsheet. Um, this was monitored by our nurse practitioner and our respiratory therapist on a monthly basis. Our MA was instrumental in creating new encounters um, that were performed outside of clinic visits. Um, we also um, uploaded the printout that you saw, the PDF format, in the appropriate folder in the EMR. Finally, the analysis was provided by the provider within 24 hours, paired with the EMR documentation, and a bill was also dropped, a professional fee. Screenshot of how the order um, looks like in our EMR system, which is Cerner, but certainly applicable to Epic and a model that could be used for other systems. Again, the PDF copy of the EMR, uh, PDF copy of this barometer results. This is a sample of what our respiratory therapist um, wrote or dropped in the EMR as the initial setup. A template the provider used for analysis here, including the interpretation of the flow volume curve, um, their numerical values, as well as recommendation based on these results. It's important to point out here, for us, we excluded the managed plan um, because there are challenges in obtaining prior authorizations, um, the time turnaround time to get approval, and a potential denial and appeal process. So in our data we're presenting here, we did not include the HMO or energy managed plans. And this is really the meat of um, the talk here, which shows graphical presentation of how we were su uh, successful in generating revenue through HS. Um, in the year 2021, which is our first graph there, um, you can see uh, the red denotes the cost that Zephyr charged us. Blue is the technical fee that was dropped. And the small black bar there is the professional fee <laughs> the provider provided for analysis. Nevertheless, um, the, green, uh, the green line graph shows the net revenue of $57,000 or so in year 2021. Now keep in mind um, the Zephyr fee waived uh, the Zephyr waived all the fees for all centers from January to June. So this um, reflects the, as far as the cost, the red bar is concerned, um, that reflects the cost for July till December. As far as this year, 2022, we have data from January to Ju uh, June, and the cost so far from Zephyr is $2,415. Um, our professional fee and technical fee as outlined here are $43,000 and $1,500 or so. Still a net profit of $42,857. The last bar graph uh, depicts the projected potential um, revenue at, by the um, end of the year um, based on the trend. And if, if the pattern continues, we projected hopefully a net positive revenue of $85,714. Now, we can do more math here and do calculations, but in summary, in the year 2021, we are looking at about a 14-fold return. In year 2022, we're projected to maybe have an 18-fold return on the investments and at least um, um, on, on the HS. So overall, we're having a very positive experience based on these graphical presentation and data. Certainly, it took a lot of work and it took a lot of um, 
um, initiations and persistence to get this going. We've learned a lot for, through this. Um, again, you know, partnering with um, administrative staff, um, as well as speaking the language, um, as far as speaking dollar amounts, importance um, in revenue generation during um, these times was important in making this successful project. Um, we also, I want to mention that the remote monitoring champion, meaning um, assigning different tasks to different members for a successful program was key. And we've also learned that we need to continue our relationship with our administration and different stakeholders that were mentioned as insurance do change, policies do change, the billing process do change. Um, so these were the lessons that we learned. And in conclusion, I want to mention that we, again, had a successful experience with revenue generation. Um, certainly, this is a model that's worked for us, but every institution has a different process. But I think the key is to identifying the key, uh, stakeholders and making sure that you can bill for all the hard work you're doing in addition to providing excellent care. Um, I think HS um, is here to stay along with telemedicine. And it can be definitely utilized both for encounters, but also outside of non-clinic encounters. Finally, some of the future things we're looking at and future needs. Um, as many of you guys know, the device um, lifespan is about five years. So it's already year two um, you know, for many of us. Um, and we have people who've lost their devices or misplaced or broken their devices. Um, plan for that. Um, it's to be determined. And what do we do about these managed care plans like I mentioned? Uh, what is the plan? So these are some of the future directions and um, hurdles to tackle. I mentioned about the remote therapeutic monitoring. We have not explored this yet, but we plan to do this um, to determine whether we'll be able to successfully bill and generate revenue on performing remote therapeutic monitoring. And finally, again, a dedicated FDE towards someone who can monitor and successfully uh, track these um, Billing and revenue will be important um, for the continuation of the program. And special thanks to everybody on the team. I don't think this program would have been successful, and I don't think we would have been able to generate the revenue without some of the people here. Certainly, I could not have done this by myself. I think it was a team effort. Um, and at this time, I'll take questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I actually have one question, which is, can you share those slides with us? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, there are some specifics around the templates and, and so on that I think everybody would find uh, helpful, and in the spirit of QI, would be interested in stealing shamelessly from you. So, so that would be great. Uh, we, we have a number of questions uh, where you have a limited amount of time to deal with it. Um, there is one uh, question about HMOs, where was it? Oh yeah, you said you excluded managed care programs. Does that mean patients with managed care insurance are not using or not offered home spirometry devices? No, they were offered their use. Our um, care center decided to actually upfront the cost and beat the dashboard costs. So um, we just weren't able to do, um, successfully bill for them and generate a revenue. Okay. Um, Can you share how many patients are in your center and how many individual home spirometry encounters you have per month? Sure. Uh, as far as HS, um, 155 or so. The active users are 144. Um, as far as encounters are concerned, um, it varies. Um, I'm trying to think. But we average about 20, 20 to 30, 25. 20 to 30. Um, Um, can one charge for a technical fee if the home spirometer is not purchased by the center? Uh, great question, actually. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, we haven't explored that, but I believe yes. Okay. Um, one last question. Are you using remote monitoring for any other populations besides CF? And if so, who's paying for the device? 
not at this moment, but certainly I think it could be applied to other patient populations, um, COPD, asthma, um, but um, as of now, uh, we have not applied it to other patient population. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to make one statement. I have to. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was like when spirometry first started, asking patients to do it weekly. That was fun, by the way, because patients are like, I do it four times a year now. I don't want to do it more. But as clinicians, we were so excited to think we could get data. And, and, and my, my big thing with training them was to have them practice with it. But you can really tell by the flow volume loop if they're having trouble with the device or not. So I kind of go by that if they need retraining. But I loved it. Remember, Laura Beth, we did that. We were like, how often are we getting them? We want them every week. And the patients were like, heck no. It's not happening. All right, our third speaker is uh, Christina Thornton. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan from July 2021 to July 2022. She is currently assistant professor of adult respirologist at the University of Calgary in British Columbia. Okay. Well, thanks very much. And thanks very much for the organizers for this invitation. I'm very excited to talk with you. Um, so this project was a kind of a subsidiary project we did from another study from my work at the University of Michigan. And hopefully implementing some of the findings we get from all these home spirometry uh, data. So in terms of my disclosures, um, I do have some postdoctoral funding um, from the CFF and my home institute, but nothing further. So home spirometry, even though it's become very popular during the COVID pandemic, we know that there's precedence for this, especially in the adult population. It's been used for many years in transplantation to monitor graft function. Um, it's been used amongst other modalities, but clearly during the COVID-19 pandemic is when things were really um, popular, in particular in CF. And we just heard from colleagues earlier how the foundation distribute um, home spirometers across the US. And with that understanding, um, there's clearly an appeal for benefit in telemedicine, um, encouraging self-management of patients and taking ownership of their own health, as well as potential opportunities for earlier intervention from a clinical perspective. So while monitoring with home spirometry has identified more pulmonary exacerbations, the clinical benefit of this is unclear. So I'm sure many in this room are familiar with the landmark E-ICE study that was published in 2017 in the Blue Journal. And what this study looked at was early intervention based on home spirometry monitoring. And while exacerbations were detected earlier, this did not translate to clinical outcomes such as a changing of trajectory of lung function decline over time. And so while that was done in the context of symptomatology and acute decline, variability of lung function during otherwise clinically stable periods or baseline health and relation to clinical outcomes is unknown. In particular, as more and more patients are being um, afforded the opportunity to do home spirometry, it's critically important as a clinician to understand, well, what is the natural trajectory or variability of these readings? And so the aims of this study were to assess performance of home spirometry in relation to our standard guidelines put out by the ATS, evaluate variation of home spirometry day-to-day -day during periods of clinical stability or baseline health, and then test associations of variation with clinical outcomes, in particular pulmonary exacerbation. So to walk you through how we went through this study, um, so this study was actually a kind of a subset study. Um, so the group at Michigan had a large prospective daily study of collection of sputum, home spirometry, and symptom scores in a larger um, study of the microbiome. Um, but we found this was a good opportunity to study some other data that can be looked at. Um, so the study initially had 16 subjects that were enrolled. And our criteria to enroll or have a secondary look um, in our data set was to have subjects that had available near daily spirometry values for at least 28 days, such that we can actually make some meaningful conclusions. Um, the subjects were provided a PICO-6 
home spirometer, which is seen there. Notably, um, it's fairly easy to use, but you can see it doesn't have like a flow volume loop, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And the subjects were given written instructions on how to do home spirometry. They were asked to do three blows per day, every day, and they were asked to be consistent in terms of timing of the day, um, around the timing of their inhaled antibiotics or inhaled therapeutics to try and standardize as much as possible. Um, moreover, as I mentioned earlier, we really sought to include patients just during periods of baseline health. So for the purposes of this study, subjects that were on systemic antibiotics, either oral or IV, were excluded from analysis. Moreover, we sought to exclude 14 days prior to initiation of treatment, simply because it is well known that there is inherent variability in lung function leading to exacerbations. Um, we sought to look at several different factors in terms of measure of use, including validity. And I think this was brought up in an earlier talk, meaning how do home spiral measures compare to clinic value? So I'll go over that. Acceptability, as defined by the ATS criteria, meaning in those subjects that had multiple blows, which we would, of course, do in clinic, how do those values compare to each other? And then finally, variation. And a term I'm going to go through quite a bit is a coefficient of variation, which is really a surrogate for FEV1 variation. It's essentially a ratio of standard deviation over mean, and it's often used in various data sets that look to define variation. So we implemented that going forward. Uh, moreover, with regards to clinical outcomes, we sought to look at these periods of baseline coefficient of variations to pulmonary exacerbations during the time of our study. On average, uh, the median length in the study was 377 days across all days. When we excluded uh, those days on systemic therapy or those in the exacerbation era, um, we were left with a median baseline reading per subject of 204 days. On average, um, the subjects use the spirometer about 50% of all study days, but you can see there's a very large range, which <laughs> I think mimics what we see in clinical practice. And even though we asked for daily readings, on average, um, the mean readings per week was about 3.2. Um, so a pretty robust, small, but robust data set. And so to break this down a little bit further, and I hope this projects okay, um, this is actually showing each subject that was included in our study. So to walk you through this, um, on the left-hand side, you can see it's been denoted by uh, stage of disease, so early, intermediate, advanced. Um, on the x-axis there, we have FEV1 uh, in terms of coefficient. On the y-axis, excuse me, on the x-axis, we have Ds. On the y-axis, we have coefficient variation. The gray bars indicate multiple baseline periods, as I noted, defined earlier. The red arrows indicate pulmonary exacerbations, so you can clearly see some subjects exacerbate quite frequently, whereas others are relatively benign. And then you can certainly see the variation in terms of time in our study. Uh, moreover, for those that have a dotted line, that's indicating their average coefficient of variation for each baseline period. So taken together across our whole cohort, we had just over 2,500 baseline days of spirometry readings. Um, over our 13 subjects, there were 40 baseline periods to be analyzed with a total of 32 exacerbations. In terms of demographics, again, a small sample size, so we can't delve into things in great detail, but the 13 subjects that were remaining to be included had a mean age of 29 years, the majority were female, and just about half were on modulator. Now, I will note um, none of these patients were on ETI because this study was completed right around ETI initiation, um, but hopefully the upcoming PROMISE study, which we'll be looking at home spiral, will also delve into this. Um, so one of the questions that was brought up, and certainly one we wanted to address before we did analysis going forward, is, is home spirometry a valid measure compared to standardized clinic? And one way to analyze that are these bland Altman plots. So what they are is they visualize the mean difference between clinic values and the mean of home values at different time points. Those dotted lines there um, are the 95% limit of agreement. Each dot represents a subject, and so if the values fall within that agreement, that's considered to be a valid test. 
And you can see for the most part, all the subjects fell within that limit of agreement, meaning it is a valid test. Um, notably, as you see, as time goes on in our study, there are less dots, meaning less subjects, because simply some patients weren't enrolled as long in the study. So I think we're comfortable, and this definitely extends on other studies that have been done in the literature, both within and outside of CF, where home spirometry is valid for the most part in compared to clinic. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the questions we were interested in was around acceptability uh, with multiple blows per day. And acceptability by the ATS, if you don't want to read the very dense document that's been put out, is summarized here, um, where acceptability is defined as grade A or B, so greater than or equal to two maneuvers within 150 milliliters of each other. So across our subjects, about 98% had two or more spirometry maneuvers per day. And amongst those, the vast majority, over 90%, were considered acceptable, meaning grade A or B. Each of these box and whiskers represents one subject. And again, you can see delineation by stage. Moreover, acceptability was not correlated with disease stage. Next, we were interested to look at FEV1 variation, um, and this was for ease of simplicity done week by week to um, aggregate the data that we had. The red asterisk indicates their clinic values at baseline, and again, it's been demarcated by stage. And what's really interesting to me is that, on average, the individual variation is about 15%, and you can see that it's quite um, heterogeneic across all subjects. Moreover, when we analyze this by coefficient of variation, which again is a surrogate of variation of lung function, we see similar patterns with a wide range. Um, one question that came up initially was that, well, is it possible those that are more advanced have less room to be variable as opposed to those that have greater lung function? And we didn't see any significant correlation of disease stage. So it really does seem to be an inherent variability of the individual patient. Um, the next piece we were interested in is that, okay, at this point we can attribute that the test is valid, it's acceptable, there's clearly variability, but now in the absence of clinical symptoms, does this variability portend to upcoming exacerbations? So the way to address this is 10 of our subjects of the 13 did have a pulmonary exacerbation during our study time frame. So as I mentioned, there was a total of 32 events that we could analyze. Um, and this was put into a Cox multivariate model with a priori clinical factors that are known to be implicated in onset of pulmonary exacerbations, including baseline um, disease stage, or denoted by FEV1 from the clinic, presence or absence of modulator therapy, um, as well as BMI. So when looking at either time to first pulmonary exacerbation defined after initiation of study onset, or time to subsequent pulmonary exacerbation seen by those that had multiple events, you can see that home coefficient of variation taken over each baseline period, again, a surrogate of variability of lung function, was not significantly associated with exacerbation. Now, one question you might have, if you remember this plot, is that there are certain individuals here that have multiple baseline periods because it's interspersed by multiple pulmonary exacerbations, whereas some individuals don't have any um, and have a fairly long period of time. So one question we had is that are we diluting our signal by taking baseline periods and maybe um, undermining those that had multiple events versus none. So to address this, we did an analysis where we took the baseline health periods, divided it over one week segments as opposed to over at risk segments, and then analyzed the coefficient of variation to try and get that to be a bit more sensitive. And you can see here, while there was a trend towards association, it did not meet statistical significance in terms of the variability of coefficient of variation. So in conclusion, in this study, um, we analyzed over 2,500 home spirometry readings from 13 individuals of CF during periods of clinical stability or baseline health to address the knowledge gap of expected variation of home spirometry. We have extended on prior observations in the literature that home spirometry is valid, acceptable, and feasible when compared to clinic. But we did observe high variation within and between individuals that exceeds what may be expected in clinic. So as a reminder, the ATS standards suggest that 12% variation may be associated with some reversibility and may be acceptable from day-to-day -day variation. But it's really unclear in the home spirometry literature. 
Moreover, we know that variability in lung function is not a new phenomena. It's been very well established from physiological parameters or factors, including time of day, weight. Um, certainly inhaled medications have a big role, especially around bronchodilators or antibiotics. Um, so there are many factors, airway clearance, that may be associated with variation um, and certainly could play a role. Moreover, while we did find that there was high intra and intravariability within home spirometry during baseline health, this variation did not coincide with shorter time to pulmonary exacerbation. Um, it is certainly interesting, in my opinion, to note that it, the variation was very individual. So some people had a very tight uh, coefficient of variation or limited range of FEV1, whereas others were quite broad. That was fairly consistent across. Limitations of this study do include a fairly small sample size, but we do believe it is rich enough to do some appropriate analysis. Um, as much as we try to ask our subjects to standardize their timing of home spiro, can only do so much. Um, it certainly predated ETI or Trikafta, and again, hopefully the PROMISE study, which will be looking at home spirometry, may help address that. Um, moreover, because this study was done with uh, uh, like written instructions for the spirometer, there is potentially a role for impact of device practice, albeit um, the way to look at that is to compare blonde Altman in the first month versus the last. We didn't see any significance there. And then lack of flow readings, so the participant doesn't have direct um, knowledge of how good their blows were. So I think the take home message behind this is that like anything we use in clinical practice, this is another tool in our tool belt. It can't be taken in isolation. And I think our findings provide important clinical context for consideration when monitoring asymptomatic patients through home spirometry. So with that, I would just like to thank my supervisors, uh, Dr. Lindsay Caverly and Dr. John LaPuma. And in particular, I'd like to thank Dr. Amalia Margaret for all her statistical help. Um, and I would be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're open to questions. I have a couple while we're waiting for others. Um, was there any attempt to compare variation um, in the patient's uh, home spirometry with what they might be doing uh, in clinic. I'm still a little bit unclear on how to make direct comparisons between your variation that you're detecting on home spirometry compared to what we normally expect with um, in-clinic spirometry. You and me both. So great question. So absolutely. So the sort of textbook answer to analyze that is with those bland Altman plots because you are comparing when they come into their standard quartile clinic visit. Interestingly, when I was doing this study, I found a very old study from pediatric pulmonology from 1981 that I had to dig up. And they actually did do daily spirometry in clinic of CF patients to address that variation question. Because of course, our patients aren't coming every day to clinic and we don't have those values. And they also noted high variation in that small study. Um, I believe the numbers on average were anywhere up to, I think, 12 to 20% variability. So I suspect it is catching some of that physiological variation that we don't see standardly. But yeah, that, that is an old study that has a lot of variation just in their technique. Yeah. Um, people are sitting, people standing, and there, there are problems with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I'm going to ask uh, other questions rather than following through on some qu other questions <laughs> I have. Um, did you ask women where they were in menstrual cycle to account for variability? No, I did not. <laughs> okay. um, the PROMISE study has coached spirometry, then non-coached. Yeah. This was all non-coached, is that correct? Correct. So because this was a subset study, it was never designed to be a primarily home spirometry study. Um, they were given written instructions and then asked to record. So right, uncoached. Okay. So now I'll, I'll, I'll ask a couple more questions. Yeah. So I, I guess from a practical standpoint, um, Given that some of your subjects had a fair amount of day-to-day -day variation, mm -hmm. I guess how do we interpret these studies for any individual patient? Um, uh, do we try and get our patients to do repeated uh, studies over a period of a few days if they are a little bit lower than they should be? Or how, how would you use this in the cl as a clinical tool? Absolutely, and that was kind of the driving question behind us doing this analysis is to look at that. So I think a couple things. First, clinical context matters. So there's no question if a patient is symptomatic or having increasing 
um, deviation from their norm, then I think variability absolutely needs to be accounted for. In the asymptomatic patient, where I see this being helpful is if there was a way to get our subjects or our patients to do some measures such that we get a sense what their norm is, what is their set point, and then if we can learn that about our patients, if there's deviation from that set point, that might help us from a clinical context to say, is there something changing from their symptomatology or a subacute exacerbation? Um, over our subjects, while some had great variability, even they were within a, a, a range. So if one of those subjects, for example, I find out their variation is now 25%, alarm bells would start to rise. Whereas in another person, maybe 10% for that might be an, an alarm rising event. So I think it just goes back to the personalization of care and enhancing our knowledge in the repertoire of our, of our subjects. Um, okay, we are getting more questions now that keep on flashing through my eyes. Um, <laughs> Do you have any information about environmental factors, smoking, yeah. air pollution? That, that's a great question, and there's um, for sure that's a confounder in this study because I don't have that information. I think to re to reanalyze the study, you would want to have really precise timing. You would want to be very clearly demarcated timing of inhaled therapy. You would want to have clear smoke exposure or environmental exposure, home environment assessment. Um, so that's definitely a confounder that's not accounted for. Okay. Here's one of my favorite questions for every, every session. How did you define a pulmonary exacerbation? Uh <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> so for the, per <laughs> well, I don't want to get in the hot seat, but for the purposes of this study, um, it was defined by a physician defined prescription of a antibiotic systemically, so oral or IV. And that's a whole other can of worms to open up, but. <laughs> okay. And then we have time for one more. Did you evaluate ATS reproducibility? Yes, so the reproducibility fits in with the accountability um, uh, sub-criteria, and yes, in that aspect, it was accounted for. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Margaret Rosenfeld. She's a pediatric pulmonologist at Seattle Children's Hospital in Seattle, Washington. She's been on faculty there since 1995, and she's currently the primary investigator of the outreach study. People are finding the best thing to do is just keep the arrow on that and then click, and this will turn yellow with five minutes. Okay, what was the first thing you said? Sorry. Oh, to advance the slides, just click there oh. with, and keep the arrow over that. This okay. isn't really working. Okay, great. So good morning, everyone. Can people hear me okay? Great. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak here today, and also for Dr. Thornton, who has, I think, uh, done wonderful work and set me up well uh, as well. So I have um, only funding from the CFF to disclose. All of us sitting in this audience are very well aware that Holmes Spirometry holds great promise, not only as a uh, really important monitoring tool in clinical care, but also as a potential clinical trial endpoint. But those of us who have been using it clinically since the beginning of the pandemic are also very aware, aware of its potential to be burdensome, confusing, and frustrating, not only for people with CF, but for uh, care providers and research teams. So with that in mind, we undertook a qualitative needs assessment describing the practices and perspectives of people with CF and also very importantly of research coordinators in planning a future clinical trial called the Outreach Study, which I'll be describing a little bit, but more generalizable to future clinical trials that might use home spirometry as a uh, home, as a primary endpoint either instead of or probably more likely augmenting in-person spirometry. So um, for folks who aren't so familiar with the Outreach Study, which is just about to begin enrolling, and I see Barb in the audience there, um, this is a multi-center prospective evaluation of home spirometry as a potential clinical trial endpoint that's going to be uh, ongoing at 20 uh, US CF centers funded by the Cystic Fibros Fibrosis Foundation. And the primary aims address some of what Dr. Thornton was getting at. We'll be looking at the 
accuracy and variability of home spirometry, also comparing coached and uncoached measurements. So participants are enrolled, uh, they have some very uh, rigorous training and education and do a, a run-in period uh, of home spirometry, both coached and uncoached, and then go on to do uh, weekly measurements over three months uh, that are uncoached, and in addition, they have three in-person visits so that we can compare home to office spirometry. And uh, within three days of each of those in-person visits, they also have coached spirometry. Um, importantly, we'll also be looking at the feasibility uh, and the participant and research coordinator experience with home spirometry. We're also looking at home height and weight, but I won't be discussing those here today. So in preparation for the trial, we really dug deep to understand the perspectives of both people with CF and research coordinators, and then to incorporate those perspectives into our study design. So in the fall of 2021, we conducted focus groups engaging both people with CF and research coordinators, that's separately, led by an experienced facilitator, Dr. Andrea Hartzler from the University of Washington, who's a bioinformaticist and an expert in qualitative research methods. And these were, of course, conducted via teleconference. We engaged 27 people with CF who were over 13 years of age and six caregivers of children with CF under 13 years of age who had had experience performing home spirometry. And uh, I have to thank CFF Community Voice for uh, engaging those individuals and conducted seven sessions with them. We also conducted sessions with 24 research coordinators who had, through the PROMISE study, uh, already done home spirometry in the research setting and they were involved in five sessions. I should also mention that in the outreach study, we are using the Zephyr X device. Our analyses followed the deductive approach of template analysis with common themes identified within each session, and then the themes were reviewed across all sessions, either of people with CF or research coordinators, to identify areas of consensus, which then were used uh, to formulate recommendations for future clinical trials, including the outreach study. So here's some high-level summary. In terms of the perspectives of people with CF, most of them found home spirometry to be very convenient, but they also experienced technical barriers, reported a learning curve to home measurements, and definitely expressed uncertainty about how good these home measurements were. In terms of the use of home spirometry in clinical trials, the perspective of research coordinators includes some major barriers, um, which included tailoring participant training to individual uh, uh, participant needs, the difficulties in scheduling remote coaching sessions, and whether or not they were truly performing remote coaching effectively. So um, there were specific recommendations that came out of the sessions that we uh, really incorporated into the design of the outreach study and we think made the study design uh, much more responsive to the needs of all of our stakeholders. So in terms of the recommendations from people with CF, that's where I'll, where I'll start, then I'll turn to the research coordinators. One recommendation was that participants should be able to keep their study spirometers after the study, so we did that to provide uh, some uh, uh, compensation for study participation, so we did that and that uh, there should be fun games and rewards for children. That's a little tougher thing to do, so we're still uh, hoping that that will come around, but we don't have the bandwidth to uh, create those ourselves. Maybe we need some kids who are gamers, but we didn't do that yet. The uh, people with CF, in terms of smartphones and reminders, suggested providing an option for a steady, steady dedicated smartphone or tablet, so we did that exploring different modalities for the weekly reminders. Those actually come through our Zephyr X app, so we didn't have so much control over that. Uh, in terms of remote coaching, they recommended providing supervised coaching at the beginning of the study to ensure confidence in the home measurements. So we definitely did that. We built in this um, really what we hope will be robust uh, training period. Um, I should also mention that we've engaged a group to do uh, overrating, grading, and feedback of all of the home measurements. Um, as Dr. Thornton alluded to, it's very important to understand whether um, the measurements are reproducible and acceptable according to ATS 2019 guidelines. And the automated um, assessment of that in any of these devices is not perfect. 
So uh, Spirometry 360 does human overreading and grading. And then if individuals are having uh, difficulty uh, on repeated attempts at doing the measurements, live video conferencing with them as well as uh, uh, texted um, uh, feedback uh, if there are just easy issues to address. In terms of the people with CF's perspectives on training and instructions, they suggested creating participant-facing materials in multiple formats tailored to participant role and age. And as I'll describe, we definitely did do that. Creating a training package, which we also did, and a cleaning package. So we did that too. The participants will get um, not only instructions on training, but all, on cleaning, but all of the materials that are required. Um, in terms of the home spirometry results, um, the participants recommended uh, explaining the similarities and differences between home and clinic spirometry. So we definitely did that. There, uh, the output is the same, and they both use the GLI reference equations, but how to do the home spirometry is a little different than the in-clinic version. And then they also suggested providing a way to flag erroneous results, and unfortunately there's not an easy way to do that, but um, the uh, automated software is good at uh, just accepting the highest results, so it's really not an issue. Now I'll flip to the uh, recommendations from the research coordinators. So in terms of the run-in or training period, they recommended tailoring, tailoring training materials and measurement cadence to individual needs. So we did do that. And combining uh, the screening visit with training in home spirometry, we definitely did that as well. In terms of remote coaching, they recommended uh, doing remote coaching and in-person spirometry on the same day. Uh, we have a three-day window around that, but this was for ease of scheduling using the run-in period to set up the workflow and expectations. We definitely did that. Sorry. That's okay. And um, they recommended su sufficient research coordinator training on how to coach and what results mean. And we spent a lot of time developing what we hope will be helpful research coordinator training materials along these lines. In terms of monitoring participant progress, they recommended active monitoring, both of data quality and participant barriers. So we did incorporate that. In terms of training and support for the research coordinators, they recommended leveraging and tailoring existing training resources that have worked well for research coordinators. So we did do that. We gathered all of the training materials from Promise, Mayflowers, Zephyrex, other sources, and kind of took the best of all of that. Um, they recommended one-on-one -on -one sessions with research therapists and research coordinators. So we definitely did that. Uh, all of the research coordinators um, have home spirometers to play around with, and we're recommended that they try uh, coach sessions with each other. They also are doing coach sessions both with Zephyrex and with Spirometry 360. So we hope by the end of that they'll feel very confident in doing the home coaching, the remote coaching. They recommended a study-specific tech support team. So we've, we basically are relying on Zephyrex for that. And then resources for non-Spanish-speaking RC. So all of our materials are translated into Spanish, and uh, we can involve uh, Spanish-speaking individuals in um, home uh, spirometry uh, coaching if necessary as well. So in terms of summary and next steps, um, the, the individuals who participated in these focus groups, both people with CFN research coordinators, provided really critical recommendations for the design of the outreach study. And we uh, feel very strongly that by incorporating these recommendations into the study design, we've made a study that's more feasible and more meaningful to our key stakeholders, who are both people with CF and research coordinators who have to do the heavy lifting for the study. And then I'm, I'm very excited to say that we, based on the results of the focus groups, undertook a really robust, robust co-production of all the outreach educational and training materials with a team of three people with CF and three research coordinators. We met every other week for five or six months and did a huge amount of work. I just can't thank these individuals enough. And out of that um, uh, really earnest co-production, we developed written and video products that cover everything about home spirometry, setup, maintenance, how to do perf uh, both coached and uncoached maneuvers for uh, individuals who are old enough to do it on their own and for parents of younger children as well as troubleshooting. And um, we really want to make these, avail these materials available to everyone. They are, uh, nothing about them is specific to the outreach study. The videos are going to be on the CF YouTube uh, channel. Um, and so if you would like to have access to any of these 
uh, please uh, contact me. I hope I put my email up here. We can share that with you because um, our, our aim is to disseminate these uh, as broadly as possible because we think they're good and because the co-production team did such hard work to create them. And um, I think my personal thought is that appropriate training and education of not only participants but also research coordinators is absolutely completely vital to having uh, accurate and reliable home spirometry measurements. I'd like to acknowledge the other uh, lead investigators of the outreach team, Drs. Uh, Andrea Hartzler, Ariel Berlinski, and Greg Sawicki, and uh, huge hats off to the TDN Coordinating Center team, and also very much to our co-production team. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, well, while we're waiting for questions, um, so this is what happens when you can set up a program where cost is a secondary consideration. <laughs> right. And, and um, but you know, there, there, I mean, it's, it's really wonderful, all the materials and, and, and the insights that, that, you, that you've gained and can potentially share, not just for research conduct, but also for, uh, for clinical work. So I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's great. So, which of, which of the things, though, in, in terms of, well, actually, let me, here's, here's a question for somebody else. What is the process for coaching, retraining a patient on the home device if they can't seem to get adequate technique on the device? Any tricks, tips, ideas from people with CF? Yeah, so, um, first of all, I, I do think it's important to acknowledge that most, if not all, all of the people who will be enrolling in the study have done um, home spirometry already clinically, and they may have learned some good habits or they may have learned some bad habits. So we'll definitely be sort of starting from square one to make sure that everyone is really doing acceptable and reproducible maneuvers. So uh, at the screening visit, we'll be uh, hopefully mostly in person, but it can be done remotely, going over really uh, digging deep into, do, into doing uh, home spirometry appropriately. Um, so that training piece is critical. And then they'll be given all, all these materials, both uh, written and video. And it may be more than folks feel, people with CF feel that they can handle. It's kind of a, a tome. So some of it's a little bit more there for reference. But we have these wonderful uh, short videos, which I'm proud to say involve some of my own patients. And they were very happy. One of them is nine years old. And he said, I want to be an astronaut and an actor when I grow up. So he was so excited to be able to be uh, in this video. And they're really brief and really engaging. Um, we engaged a professional, professional videographer to help us, and boy, did that make a huge difference. So they're just four minutes long, and I think they'll be very, very, very helpful. Um, and then during this run-in run -in training period, which is two to four weeks, uh, the individuals will be required, the participants, to do repeated, both coached and uncoached spirometry with almost immediate overreading by Spirometry 360, and then they'll be providing grading and feedback directly to the participants. And then there'll be the opportunity to uh, do um, video coaching with them if there are issues that arise. So people do have to be able to show they can do acceptable and reproducible spirometry, specifically FEV1, to move into the main study, but we hope that with all those guardrails, almost all of them will be able to do so. Uh, here's a question. Oh, another one. Um, how often will you ask participants to use the device? Uh, yeah, so in outreach, uh, they'll be doing uh, spirometry weekly, and then a couple of additional coached sessions. Um, we're noticing more patients with anxiety around spirometry and wondering if those with more variation in results will experience more anxiety around home testing. Do you have any thoughts about addressing test anxiety? That's a great question. Um, not specifically, I wonder if somebody in the audience might. I think one thing we will be reinforcing, however, it's not slightly, not completely answering your question, is that this is a research study and the results are, are not going to be transmitted to the clinical team. And so if individuals have concerns about their results, they need to go directly to their clinical team. I was wondering if Dr. Thornton will also be presenting maybe next year for results during exacerbations. I'd love to see those results as well. Okay. Um, OK, 
Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you're here and um, that you gave that feedback. So thank you. Oh, I, so just so everyone heard, this uh, uh, young woman is a 55-year-old. Did I get that right? With uh, cystic fibrosis, who's saying, <laughs> from my vantage point, um, who's saying that um, uh, anxiety is a real thing and probably does indeed have to do with variability and whether it's worrisome or not worrisome, so that we need to address that issue. And I really appreciate that. Right, and further pointing out that explaining to the patients or subjects ahead of time the, that there is an expected degree of variability and giving them a little bit of a feel for what that, what that degree will be will be helpful in terms of making them feel a little bit better. Thank you for your comment. I appreciate that because we see that a lot in adult clinics, the, the anxiety around PFTs from, from many patients really. And most of it, uh, the variability is what the issue is, because they'll come in, they'll feel great, their numbers are down, they're like, how can this be? You know, I'm feeling really good. So they've kind of had the rug pulled out from them someone with that variability. So it's a good thing to pick up in our practices to explain that there is variability day to day. Well, the pediatric pulmonologist greatly appreciates that comment. Thanks. <laughs> and one last question I think you might have already addressed, but are you able to share training materials so we don't have to reinvent the process? Not only are we able to, we want to, we would love to. So um, I'm not sure the best way of distributing my email address, but um, the, the videos will be posted on the CFF YouTube site soon. I don't think they're quite up there yet, right? Anyway, very soon, and, but we would just really love to share all of the materials. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Our, our next and last speaker is Pam Peterson. Pam has been the adult respiratory therapist in the pediatric, on the pediatric CF team of Advocate Children's Hospital in Oakland, Illinois for the past 12 years. She's involved in CF education yes, and the home spirometry so program. Keep the, keep the arrow over there, just click on this, okay. And this will uh, be green, about 10 minutes, about five minutes left, it'll turn yellow. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, as Mary said, my um, name is Pam Peterson, and I am the respiratory therapist in the outpatient clinic, pediatric clinic. Um, I have no relationships to disclose for this presentation. So just to give you a little background, um, March of 2020, um, the Advocate Children's Hospital Pediatric Outpatient Clinic and the PFT lab completely closed down. I'm sure you all remember um, that time. It was uncertain, it was challenging. In our particular clinic, it was myself and one other nurse and it was a virtual ghost town there. Um, and then one week before the shutdown, our nurse coordinator went out on a medical leave of absence, and she was out for the rest of the year, just to give you some context there. Um, in April of 2020, our center director was notified of the home spirometer program through the CF Foundation. We met virtually to discuss which patients would be chosen for the first um, spirometers, and those were based on lung severity. And then patients were contacted 
by phone, email, or portal, introducing them to the program. In May of 2020, our first seven devices were ordered. I think at that time it was 10% of your um, clinic number could be um, ordered. So we ordered our first seven. Um, once the devices were received at the hospital, I um, put an instruction sheet inside of it that had um, instructions for downloading the app, for cleaning, disinfecting the, um, the device, and then it was sent out to the patients via FedEx. Patients were asked um, to contact me once they received the device so that we could set up a training. Now, little did they know that I received all the tracking emails, so if I didn't hear from them about a week after I got that tracking email, I would contact the, um, the patient. So um, this is a picture. I didn't include any of uh, brand names on it, but this is a picture of the actual device. It's a small device. Um, you can hold in your hand, handheld device, and it's about the size of an iPhone, so very small. So the initial visit was done um, through Zoom. There were two devices needed at that time, one a phone or a tablet or a, a laptop, but one device with the app installed on, on it, and then the other device was to view the patient actually doing the test. So this could be very challenging, um, if the app was not set up, if it wasn't paired with the device when we got on the first visit, um, or if a patient only had uh, an iPhone and they were starting the testing, um, the, the screen would go blank when I tried to, um, when I was doing this testing with them, so I couldn't actually uh, view their technique. So we used the, um, the last recorded PFTs that were done in clinic as their baseline, and there were several, um, many of the, the six-year-olds didn't have any um, baseline PFTs, so um, we just um, went with their first test. So initially, uh, the patients were asked to perform a couple of tests per week, just kind of reinforce that technique. It was different, it's a different technique than um, the testing in clinic. Um, the device is a turbine, and so airflow, they're very sensitive to airflow, so just a little bit of um, airflow, if they held it in front of them, would start the, start the testing. Um, unlike the, the um, tests that were done in clinic, where they could put the mouthpiece in their mouth and just do normal tidal breathing, and then um, take that big breath in. So that took a little bit of adjustment. Now, a few of our diligent patients did um, do a couple of tests per week just to kind of get that technique down, um, but many of our other patients needed reminders, quite a few reminders, actually. Um, currently, patients are asked to complete one test um, per week, or one test, I'm sorry, a week before their visit. Um, that way, there's plenty of time to um, have them repeat the test if they're if it's not acceptable or um, they needed help with technique. For some of our more um, forgetful patients, I ask them to do monthly tests in hopes that we get it quarterly. And then um, for scheduling um, of the of the PFTs. If a, if a patient has been doing the test pretty consistently and they have good technique, then um, they only have to come in to the clinic one, one time per year to have that done, to have their PFTs done. So this slide shows um, the actual screenshot. So initially, patients would um, do their test and then send email the screenshot. So the screenshot gave some um, good results, one flow volume loop, but it was very limited. It didn't show any additional information and it didn't show um, the efforts. And then sometimes a patient would send in the wrong screenshot. So they would just do a test and send that in and then I would have to follow up with them. Um, so in November of 2021 is when we got onboarded to the dashboard 
and it proved to be very helpful with all of the um, one of the other speakers showed the, the actual dashboard when you go into it and you can see all the patients. So it was very nice to be able to see the patients um, on one site. Uh, there was the ability to review each effort and um, review the past results as well. And then a PDF could be generated um, and then printed out and this could be scanned into the patient chart or reviewed with the patient. So on this provider dashboard on the top, it's um, demographics, and then below that are the, the um, curves. And then after the curves come the best um, numeric values of the test. And then all the way at the bottom, you can see um, the efforts. And on this particular test, there's only three efforts. So live coaching. Um, that came about a few months after we started on the dashboard uh, that uh, live coaching became available. So if patients' test results are, have um, decreased a little bit or um, their technique was questionable, I would request a live coaching session. We also have a few of our patients that um, have requested regular live coaching sessions with me. Uh, they feel that they're able to do a better job, and I think it's actually the social aspect of it. They like that. And the ability to troubleshoot as well. So this is um, the picture of what I would see when I'm live coaching. My husband so graciously um, agreed to be my patient on here. Um, so I would just go to that to the dashboard, click on the desired um, patient account, and then click on Start Remote Session. From there, a notification would be sent to the patient's phone or tablet, and then they could accept it right from there, and then um, just start the testing. I would start the series, and then um, the patient could do up to, to eight efforts. Another nice benefit of this dashboard is if you can see the emojis, some of the kids love that. I just send them a thumbs up or a wave and, and they think that's great. So who's in charge of this program? Now, so initially, this was entirely RT run from ordering devices, contacting patients, mailing devices, sending reminders, receiving emailed screenshots, reviewing the test with the pulmonologist, and scanning the results into the patient chart. Um, but currently, there's collaboration between um, myself and the nurse. She's on the dashboard now as well. Um, so we can, we can um, together, you know, figure out scheduling for PFTs and patient reminders. And then we also have the help of the medical assistant. So in May of 2020 until present time, 44 spirometers have been distributed to patients. Two of those patients declined training. Those were, um, again, I work in pediatrics, so these were younger children, and the patients felt like, or the parents felt like, this is, we just don't want to do one more thing at home. So they have declined, but they have it, and, and that's something that I'll address with them. I just felt like I was becoming a little bit too pushy. You know, are you, are you, do you want to do the training? Do you want to do the training every time I saw them? So give them a little time, and I think that really, um, People enjoy it. People enjoy the, the ability to do it at home. So I will keep um, on with that. One of our patients expired. This was an adult patient. And then I recently learned that one of the, the um, devices was lost in a move. So I'm not sure about, I did see on another slide also, like to, trying to determine how, um, you know, we can get replacements if possible. And then the other patients have opted to continue. Now, the majority of patients who use these um, home devices are very satisfied. They're comfortable, they're small and easy to, to handle, uh, they're convenient. So patients can test when it's convenient for them. They can test on the weekend, they can test in the evening. It doesn't have to be that, you know, hour before their clinic visit. Um, 
and it's quick. It takes about 15 minutes or less, and it does decrease their appointment time. So patients are generally scheduled one hour ahead of their clinic visit for their PFTs. So if they're, if they're doing a good job with their PFTs, um, their home PFTs, then um, they only have to have the one in clinic per year, and that cuts down an hour for them out of their treatment time. And that's a big deal for these patients. They're, here, they're in clinic for a long time, um, so whatever we can do to help make that a smoother um, uh, clinic visit. And then um, FEV1, this is one of my favorite part, actually. The FEV1 home and clinic results are consistent. So initially, so this is a comparison of home and clinic um, results. And we took 19 patients that had a clinic PFT and then a home, did a home PFT within a month um, to compare. And I was so thrilled to see this screen um, just because initially we just weren't sure. And even on the listserv, it would say, you know, some of the results are, are accurate, very accurate, and others would say they're not accurate. And so this was just really reinforcement for myself and for our team to see that um, they're very consistent and very encouraging. Oh, and I do have an example. So um, early on, we had a patient that um, he had started Trikafta, and when he did his home PFT, his home um, test, the pulmonologist did not think that the results could be accurate, that he thought they would be higher um, than they were. And so he was scheduled, this patient was scheduled in clinic within a couple days. The results were virtually identical. So again, encouraging in that way. So our conclusions, with proper instruction and good technique, home spirometry produces accurate results. And so important, and one of the most important aspects here is that home spirometry enabled the monitoring of lung function on our patients at a time when it was impossible. Everything was shut down. We had no, no way to do that. And then home spirometry has proved to be a patient satisfier. And then patients can also, um, on the app, they can see their past results. They can, they can follow them. They can trend their... Um, their results, and their, the app holds multiple tests. What, what is needed? So a dedicated respiratory therapist is crucial for the success of this um, pro program. Patient reminders sent out um, by the portal or by email, frequent review of patient results, following through in live coaching, troubleshooting with the patients, and then getting these results into the patient chart. These are all time-consuming tasks and um, really require a dedicated therapist. So I would like to acknowledge um, our medical director, Dr. Javid Akhtar, um, who was supportive in this program. It was actually him virtually and then me, and that's it. Um, and then my CF team, who many are here today, so I thank you all. And then our really incredible, great patients who um, had to make such big changes during this time. It was such a tough time, and just kudos to all those patients. Um, really doing a great job with that. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, was your live coaching conducted through a telehealth visit, or did you say you were able to accomplish that through the dashboard? So the live coaching sessions um, were done right through the dashboard, which made it really nice and easy for the patients because they just had their, um, their device with the app, click on it, and they're all set up with their app. So that the live coaching feature on the um, on the provider dashboard is excellent. How often is height updated? 
Our FEC and peak expiratory flow also evaluated for acceptability and reproducibility. Are these done pre or post bronchodilator or not noted? Do nose clips matter? That was a bunch of questions. Yes. Should we start with one at a time? How often is height updated? So it's updated, I ask them to update it every time they do their test. These are, these are little kids, so if they're doing it twice a week, it's not going to be updated. Um, if they've been into clinic and I see they didn't up, update it, I'll update it myself, which I have that um, ability to do that on the dashboard. Are FVC and PEF also evaluated for acceptability and reproducibility? Yes, they are, and um, actually that's also right on the dashboard. Um, is it acceptable and is it repeatable? Are these done pre or post bronchodilator or not noted? That is a great question because I asked the patients to do the, um, their home spirometry, home spirometry testing about 30 to 60 minutes after they do their um, regimen of um, um, NABs and airway clearance. So I hope they are. Yeah, although actually the CF registry asks for a pre bronchodilator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, um, they would just do their their whole regimen. It's not, yeah. Yeah, not yeah. Necessarily. And then, do nose clips matter? Yes, they absolutely matter. So at first, when these devices came out, the, the home spirometers in the box, they had nothing in them. So I would just put the the nose clips in with them, and then um, the instructions send them out. Later, they started sending out devices with the nose clips in them, and I also asked the patients to stand. Okay. We have two questions about billing. Are you doing any billing? No, I'm not doing any billing, so I'm very interested to hear what's going on with the billing aspect. I have um, looked into it and placed it in the lap of our director, but I'm the only therapist in the outpatient clinic, and I cannot pursue any, anything like that. I mean, I work in a lot of clinics, so... Um, I'm learning today some more information that I can um, bring back to them. So thank you for that. How do you help patients who lose parts of home spiro, such as mouthpiece? Okay, so the mouthpieces um, can be ordered. And actually, I had, did have a patient, and he was an adult patient, that lost, his, lost the mouthpiece. So I ordered them, a um, couple of them. So I have an ex extra one. So they can be ordered, but the whole device I'm not sure how to approach that. Um, I did send an email out just stating that our patient, it was a pediatric patient, they lost the device in a move. Would it be possible to um, replace it? But I haven't heard back yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually told that there are some insurance companies that are starting to pay for, uh, pay for them. It's probably very dependent on your insurance company. Yes. Yeah. So um, working with adults, we get... Lots of spirometers are lost through moves, you know, different things, traveling, whatever. So um, at first, we, you have to reorder them through Zephyr and they, they on their order form. And they were $149 a piece, and we weren't billing insurance. Patients were picking up that cost. CF Foundation has a deal with Zephyr now that they're $99. So, and, th and that's the other question. How, what are we going to do when these devices you know, have lived their lifespan, like how are we going to replace those? So that's a big question for the future too. Just to add to what Mary's saying, um, I believe that through Amazon you can get the same ones for about $99. Yeah, but, but I think, I'm not sure, but I think you had to get them through Zephyr to get them to be connected Onto to the, the dashboard. dashboard. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, how many patients do you have in your clinic? Do you know how many monitor their home spiro regularly and have been able to switch to yearly in-person visits? I don't have the exact numbers for that. We have about 60 patients in our clinic. Um, so, I, I, again, it's, it's mostly myself just doing this. So that's something that I can, um, moving forward, I can um, try to keep a better tab on. Um, we just kind of go, I look at, the, look at their results and then see when they're coming in, when they last had their in-clinic PFT, or um, you know, are their 
home spirometer um, results good and acceptable, repeatable, and then we kind of go from there. Okay. Scheduling. And, and, and just for my own clarification, are you, were you saying that you're having patients actually do home spirometry prior to in person visits, and so if they do that, you're not doing spirometry yes. in clinics? So yes. they're still coming in mm -hmm. for a visit, but their spirometry is being done at home. Yes, yes. Now, some, some of our patients um, virtually um, come in, like they can, if they are, one visit is in person, the next one can be um, virtual. Some of the patients don't opt for that, some do. It just depends. Oh, here's another. Here. What would you recommend doing to motivate pediatric patients and families to use their home spirometer who have already, who already have a poor view of the device? In other words, how do you get people to do it? I would, I would definitely say try the live coaching with them. I think that, that I'm totally sold on the live coaching. I think it's a, just a great tool. Um, but again, I feel like I'm a cheerleader for these patients, you know. Hey, this is a great, this is, this is for you. This is an opportunity for you to um, kind of, um, you know, shave some of that time off of your visit. And you can do it when you want. You can do it when it's convenient. So I don't know. I, I think that's the best I would have to say about that. Use the live coaching. Um, and then really just encourage them, um, you know, give them the positive um, uh, aspects of, of using the home spirometer. So one, one thing that for the naysayers and the doubters, when you show them that it's accurate, if you have them bring it in and they do their home spiro and then do a mm -hmm. PFT in clinic, that usually changes. I, I think that's one of the things they fear that, you know, how's this little device, you know, the same as the spirometry unit in the clinic? So proving the accuracy yeah. really helps with with that sometimes too. So um, again, it, adding to what you're saying is, so the PDF um, printout of the dashboard is so nice to bring into your patient and then kind of review. And I'm like, can you believe we're getting all of this information from one little device that you're doing at home and we're able to see all your efforts and um, you know the best tests and what's acceptable, what's repeatable and, and all that. So that again is another um, you know, piece of information that's really helpful for these patients to see that they're getting all of that information from this one device. Yeah, that's one of the benefits of the dashboard. That was a question someone asked earlier, why get the dashboard? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, being able to see trends is really important. You know, it, it makes the uh, information so much more valuable for sure. And then you can see who your high users are, too. It, it tallies right. up how many mm -hmm. times uh, patients have used their device. And, and I kind of was getting, you know, you can get the feel that the, the very high lung function over 90 don't use it as much because they're in a whole other world now. But my, my mid-range uh, lung function patients use it the most. And, and Zephyr will give you data like that. You can collect, you can, you know, ask them questions and they'll, they'll do an analysis of your center for you. And then my lower lung functions patients weren't using it much either because it's just so much work for them mm -hmm. that they, mm -hmm. they really um, only want to do it when they absolutely have to. Okay. Do you want to repeat the question? <laughs> the question is, um, is there a minimum number of um, measurements that should be done by home spirometry in order to accurately monitor lung function? Is that a fair rewording? Okay. Pretty. 
So I, I don't feel I have the uh, magic number for that, but we're trying to get, what we would do in clinic is um, four times a year with their clinic visits. So approximately, at minimally that, that many. That's our goal. I, I can give you my opinion as a pediatric pulmonologist. Um, basically, um, what I would ideally like my patients to do, and I will have to admit that the ideal is not often met, but what I would ideally like my patients to do is just routinely check it at least once a month, and then when they're not feeling well. Um, and then so their, their monthly checks will allow us to perhaps get an early idea of their lung function dropping when they're not really aware that there's something going on. But then when they have a sense of, you know, they're a little congested, they have a cold or whatever, then we want them to monitor that to watch and see what happens as they go through that period. Maybe start doing some increased airway clearance um, and see whether they will then get back up to what their previous baseline had been, and then I want to know about it, you know. So, um, so it does vary by, by patient and, and uh, you know, by what's going on. What I find interesting, and if anybody's interested, what I find interesting is um, that there are some patients and some families that do lots of PFTs, and there are some that it just really feels like a huge um, burden, and I can't get them to do it. Um, and even kids who I see in clinic, and their PFTs are down a little bit, and I say, well, I'm kind of concerned about that, but maybe you're having a bad day, or maybe you're still trying to get through this cold. Please go ahead next week, you know, get PFTs again, and then we'll check and see whether it's back up, and then I don't hear from them. Then we've got to chase them down. Mm -hmm. So that, that happens more than I would have expected. Um, so um, obviously there's a lot going on in their lives. There's you know, reasons why they're not doing it. But, um, but um, you know, again, the, the, the need for how frequently you get them done, I think, depends on individual circumstances. Well, right, I say that too, but, and then, but then again, we lose track, they don't respond, and so on and so forth. But right, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, it is a, it is a wonderful tool that enables us mm -hmm. in these kinds of situations to, to avoid maybe treating anti, with antibiotics, for example, uh, when, you know, you know, maybe this is transient, maybe you can just get over it with a little bit of airway clearance and you don't have to spend your day coming back into clinic to get rechecked because you can do it at home. So it's, it would seem to be a fantastic opportunity and you know some people do pick up on it but again as I say I'm surprised that sometimes people don't. Okay, I think we're done. Okay, well thank you all. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And, and thank you all for coming. And, and again, I think that you know, this just gives us some idea about what the potential is for the future for home spirometry.